Welcome back to The Place We Find Ourselves. I'm Adam Young, and today we are talking about how healing happens. This is part two of a three-part series on the whole subject of healing. Last week, we talked about the U diagram and about the importance of engaging particular scenes of heartache and harm in order for healing to begin to take place for you. The U diagram was created and developed by Kathy Lorzell, who is the executive vice president of the Allender Center. And I have found Kathy's U diagram to be incredibly helpful for doing good story work. And by the way, if you want a guide to writing out one of your stories, I have a free resource on my website that walks you through how to do that. So you can visit adamyoungcounseling.com and access it under free resources. Today we continue our discussion of what the process of healing requires and what it looks like. Thank you for listening. Let me begin by saying that if you haven't listened to last week's episode, How Healing Happens Part 1, you may feel a little lost at times during this episode. Last week, we talked about this thing called the U diagram, uh, which I got from the Allender Center, and it is about the necessity of lingering in death in order for healing uh, to begin to exist. Let me clarify that entering the U isn't in order to relive or reenact the heartache or the trauma, but rather the purpose is to follow the pattern of Jesus's life that I believe we are each called to follow. In other words, the narrative of Friday, Saturday, Sunday. On Friday, there is the crucifixion, torture, trauma, death. On Saturday, there is the descent into hell. It is the essence of the valley of the shadow of death. And then on Sunday, deep joy, the hope of resurrection, and most of all, surprise. Sunday is always a surprise when it happens. Now, sliding down the descending slope of the U diagram is to slide down into the reality of a particular story of heartache and to remember in our bodies and spirits the bodily sensations and the emotional realities of those moments, of the story. We don't do this in order to be martyrs, but rather to truly face the truth contained in those moments, in those minutes, so that we can confess to God what has really happened to us. And last week, we talked about common ways that we try to avoid the pain of this process. The absolute bottom of the you is a deep grief, and that grief is what propels you back up the other side, into newness, into surprise, into resurrection. Today's main point is simply this. If you linger in death, if you dip down into the bottom of the you, you will enter sorrow and grief. And grief is met by the comfort of God, which brings a newness to your heart, a restoration of vitality and joy, So in Matthew 5, Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Grief is the body's natural response. It's a natural response to seeing the truth of the heartbreak of your story. When you enter death deeply, when you actually allow yourself to dip down, you will begin to experience grief. I'm often asked, how do I learn how to grieve? You do not have to learn. You don't have to learn how to grieve. Your body already knows how to do it naturally. The real question is, how do you bring yourself to actually feel your feelings? Another way of saying that is, what are you doing to refuse to feel your feelings? What are you doing to resist spending time in your limbic brain. So it's not that you have to learn to grieve. It's merely that you have to stop refusing to feel, stop numbing out, stop closing your eyes to what is true, stop doing an end run around death. 
Stop trying to walk along the top of the U diagram, skipping merrily from Friday to Sunday. I will never forget when I was at the Allender Center some years ago and a woman named Kathy Lorzell said this. She said, true grief is when you are captured by your story. It is this sense of, oh, yes, that is what happened. True grief is when you are captured by your story. You cannot enter the grief that is yours until you engage your story, but far more until you're captured by your story. To be captured by your story is to have your mouth hanging open as you reflect on what you endured as a boy or as a girl. Again, the invitation is to awe. Do you have a sense of awe about your story? If you don't have a sense of awe, What is keeping you from seeing that little boy or girl well? Because he or she suffered immensely in this world. You do not make it to adulthood in a broken and fractured and sin-laden world without having immense heartache, harm, suffering. If you can't find awe about your own story... Can you find it while listening to the stories of others? I mean, even some of the the podcast guests, as you have heard and listened to their stories, have you found yourself feeling a sense of awe at what they endured? Awe is in the word awful. It's also in the word awesome. Sometimes the heartache of another connects us to the grief that is ours. It connects us to a sense of awe about what they have endured what they have suffered, what they have survived. You will not be captured by your story until you are willing to name the fullness of the harm you have experienced. Very often we're willing to name some of it. We're willing to acknowledge some of the harm, but we stop short of the really nauseating parts. And those are the parts that will midwife us into grief. For example, perhaps you have named that you were sexually abused by your cousin. Uh, And that took great courage. It took honesty. And indeed, it has brought you partway down the you. However, you have not yet named that when you told your family about it, your grandmother was actually really upset, but your mother did not seem to care at all. You have been faithful to enter the death of the sexual abuse proper, but no one has helped you name that part of you died when you realized that your mother actually had no reaction. Naming this allows you to engage a new level of sorrow, a death that you have been suffering in your body for decades, but has never been named and therefore could never be grieved and therefore could never be comforted by God. Now, just as an aside, uh, to be captured by your story also involves being surprised by your glory. What do I mean by that, your glory? Your glory is simply those aspects of your being, your person, that reveal the character of God. Glory means goodness, weightiness, substance, and above all, splendor. Do you know that as someone created in the image of God, you bear an immense amount of glory? You bear an immense amount of splendor, of goodness. Consider the story that I just shared. Why did part of that girl die when she realized that her mother was unmoved by her sexual abuse? Because the girl in the story has a deep need and longing for a mother for a mother to rise up in protection and care for her daughter when she's been sexually abused. The girl in the story longs for her mother to protect her, to fight for her, to be overcome with anguish because of her deep empathy for her daughter. That longing for connection and tenderness from her mother is absolutely glorious. It is so good. It is the heart of what it means to be created in the image of of a triune God. The girl in the story has not yet killed her desire for her mother's protection. She hasn't killed her desire for a mother. 
The girl's desire for mom to want to protect her, to want to fight for her. This is such a holy and glorious and good desire. Part of naming the full truth of your story, part of being captured by your story, is naming the immense glory of the young girl in that story. You won't be fully heartbroken about your mother's contempt for you as her daughter until you name how good it was that you longed for your mom to be a good mother to you in that moment. As small as the hope may have been, that hope for her mother to care, you know, the sense of maybe she'll fight for me if I tell her about the abuse, that hope is what prompted the daughter to risk reaching out for mom by telling her about the sexual abuse. Now, the daughter likely hates that she had such a longing for her mom to be a mom in that moment, but her hatred of her longing in no way minimizes the immense godliness and goodness of the longing of her heart for mom to step in with protection and care and comfort. Okay, it was an aside, but it's important. Uh, Back to the U diagram. Have you grieved your own deaths? I mean, it's a simple question. Have you grieved your own deaths? In this girl's story, her death is not, please hear this, her death is not merely the sexual abuse, as awful as that may have been. Another death, and oftentimes a more grievous death, is her realization that her mother didn't give a rip that she was abused. You have experienced the death of Christ. What if you took seriously your stories of death? What if you helped a friend take seriously her stories of death? The invitation is to grow in sorrow. The more sorrowful we are, the more open we are to the comfort of God. It's only the truth that sets people free. The truth will set you free, but it is only the truth that will set you free. And the truth is often very disruptive and very disturbing. By and large, truth is largely lacking in this world, and it is particularly largely lacking in the church. I know that is a provocative sentence. Uh, It it is a robust sentence, uh, but sadly, I think in many ways it is a true sentence. And by the way, when you are the listener to another's story, you know, rather than the storyteller, your your aim is to midwife them into the bottom of the you. Uh, that is such a gift that you can give a storyteller. Anything short of that lacks kindness. And so your 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 gift to them, your aim is to facilitate a stronger and more honest naming of truth. Anything short of that lacks kindness, but it can be very hard to do. Why? Uh, Because when someone shares part of their story with you, they will often invite you to lie to them, to agree that their story isn't that disturbing. You are not called to be helpful in that moment. You are called to be truthful. And the truth will invite people into the valley of the shadow of death. There's something in us that resists naming what has been true of our story and to resist naming what has been true of another story. Each one of us has made sense of our story somehow. More often than not, the way we have done this has not been very accurate. But in order to engage in true grief, your story has to be told truthfully. It has to be told accurately. You have to be named well in the story, in the particular narrative. If someone is having a difficult, if you are having a difficult time entering grief, entering sorrow, it is often because you have not been named well enough yet in your story. What does that mean? Well, uh, for example, uh, when I was in seventh, eighth, ninth grade, uh, I was mercilessly uh, made fun of for shaving my legs. I didn't shave my legs. I just didn't have a lot of hair on them. And a rumor started in seventh grade that I shaved my legs and it went around the whole school and I couldn't make it stop. 
It was utter powerlessness. Uh, it, it, it was amazingly humiliating for me as a boy becoming a man. But as awful as all of that was, it wasn't actually the full truth of the grief that was mine. Because I had not named that my mother was too anxious to help me and my father never pursued my heart enough to ask what was wrong. And when I finally cried out and said to them, I can't bear going to school, their response to me was not good. It was, I was an inconvenience to the life that they were trying to live. And so the loneliness and the further powerlessness and frankly, the further humiliation that I experienced had not yet been named. So here's a simple question. Who are you protecting in your story? Because I was protecting my parents. Every time you defend those who hurt you, you are refusing to linger in death. You are refusing to enter the reality of the crucifixion. You are turning a blind eye to what has actually been true of your story. You have named perhaps that your brother sexually abused you, but you haven't named that you actually got more love from him than you got from your father. Do you hear the heartache in that? You've named that your brother sexually abused you. What you haven't named is that he actually loved you more than your own father. You may have named the helplessness associated with your abuse, the powerlessness associated with the abuse, but have you named the abandonment by your mother and father, if that was true in your story? And again, a provocative sentence, and I'm not even going to back it up in this podcast, but let me just put it out there. Uh, if you have been sexually abused, it is almost guaranteed that there was set up for that abuse that involved abandonment and or contempt from your parents. You will not fully be captured by your story until you name the setup for the abuse. In other words, until you name the dynamics in your family of origin that put you in a position to be groomed by someone who did not intend to provide care for you, but intended to, to, to violate you. Now, I, I want to take a minute to talk about Psalm 42 so that you can see what descending down the you like looks like and what it looked like for the psalmist. There, there are dozens of psalms that include the language of someone who's sliding down into sorrow, grief, despair. But we will just look for now at Psalm 42. And this is what we read in verse 5. It says, how bent my being, how you moan for me. Now, it probably doesn't say that in any of your English translations because that is a translation from Robert Alter, who is a Jewish uh, scholar, a, a language scholar, um, and he, he translates it really, really well because the Hebrew in the Psalms is poetry. And a lot of the poetic power of these uh, Psalms gets eliminated, sadly, in translation. So the NIV, the New International Version of the Bible, translates this line like this. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? It's not a bad translation, but it's not what the Hebrew literally says. And in order to understand how raw the psalmist is here, you have to look at the Hebrew. The Hebrew literally says, how bent my being how you moan for me. And the psalmist says this line three times in the poem. It's in verse five, verse seven, verse 12. He repeats himself. Now what's going on here? Well, the Psalms are such an astonishingly raw and honest reflection of what life is actually like. And what the psalmist is talking about is being in the fetal position on the ground, moaning. How bent my being. The Hebrew word for bent here means to be crumpled or to be in collapse or to melt away. Many English Bibles translate this word as downcast. My soul is downcast, but it means a lot more than that. The root of this word also appears in, in Psalm 44, where it says, we are brought down. There's the word brought down to the dust. Our bodies, here's the verb again, cling to the ground. Cling. 
cling to the ground. Do you see it? The images of a human body melting into the earth, collapsing on the floor. The psalmist is in the fetal position, his body bent over itself. This is a very accurate description of what it's like at the bottom of the U. And I want you to see how rigorously honest and relevant to modern life this psalm is. Because here's how it unfolds. Verse 5, how bent my being, how you moan for me. But then in verse 6, there is a shift. The psalmist starts talking to himself, saying, Hope in God, for yet will I acclaim him for his rescuing presence. What a true-to-life psalm. The speaker starts out saying that he's on the floor in agony. He feels his present state of pain, and he confesses how bad things really are. My being is bent. I'm collapsed on the floor. But verse 6, there is a shift. He exhorts his own heart to hope in God, because soon he will be praising God for his rescuing presence. But then, verse 7, he feels his present state once again as the pain overtakes the hope of God's rescue. And he cries out, my God, my being is bent on me. I'm back on the floor. I'm bent over, back where I was. Do you see? This is the anatomy of the soul in pain. These shifts represent the machinations of the human heart in the midst of emotional crisis. This is what it's like when we're in pain. We go through these undulations of despair and then hope and then gratitude and then praise and then despair and then anger. So it continues. Verse 7b, another shift occurs inside of him. He remembers more good times of shalom with God. And he says, therefore, do I recall you from Jordan land from the Hermans and Mount Mazar. These are places where the psalmist felt connected to God. And he's naming them with particularity because he remembers these are places where he felt connected to God. And he's calling them to mind to soothe his own heart. But then, bam, verse 8. All, he's talking to God, all your breakers and waves have surged over me. Suddenly, the psalmist is wrestling with the feeling that God is the one who has made his life so hard. He feels his pain rise up anew, this time feeling like God has caused it. All your breakers and your waves have surged over me. Have you not experienced these shifts in your own heart? I mean, sometimes in a matter of minutes. How true these shifts are for the man or woman who is in despair, yet still talking to God. Then verse 9, he reminds himself that God ordains kindness for him. He says, by day the Lord ordains his kindness, and by night his song is with me. But this doesn't last very long because everything changes in verse 10. Verse 10, I would say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why in gloom do I go, hard pressed by the foe? What just happened? The hope of verse 9 has morphed into deep questions for God and accusations against the very God whom the psalmist is trying to remind himself treats him with kindness. And then the whole process, I'll stop, but the whole process continues on. It repeats itself in verse 12. This is the anatomy of the soul in pain. These shifts represent what happens in the human heart in the midst of emotional crisis. Frankly, this is emotional health. This is the how of healing. So, summary, the path to healing necessarily involves an engagement with the particular stories of your life that have brought deep emotions of heartache, of shame, of rage, of fear, of terror, of despair, of arousal. I mean, the the emotions that flood us when we engage honestly and truthfully some of the more painful moments of our lives. The path to healing necessarily requires engaging those things. And I'm describing it in the context of this U diagram where you descend down into what the Old Testament calls the wilderness, the desert, the valley of the shadow of death. And the claim is that something happens 
at the bottom where God intervenes and you are catapulted in time. It doesn't happen in a day, but you are catapulted back up the other side of the you into the newness and the surprise of resurrection. And that's what we're going to talk about next week in part three. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, Music for today's episode was provided by Rick Wilson and Rob Mathis. If you're enjoying this podcast, please head over to iTunes and write a review that explains a little bit about how the podcast has been impacting you. Thank you so much. See you next week.